Hey everyone, my name is Philip, and I'm a software engineer at Quantsight and a Torch Vision maintainer. Today I'm going to talk to you about the extension of Torch Vision transforms to object detection, segmentation, and video tasks. Of course, a major extension like this is not a solo effort. Apart from myself, Victor and Vasilis help bring this to you. Before we dive into what improvements we actually make, let's have a quick look at the status quo. In the snippet on the left, you see a minimal augmentation pipeline suited for image classification. This use case is already handled well by our current API. In the result on the bottom right, you see the image is flipped, flipped the hue has changed, and it's rotated a little bit. And so far, so good. But what happens if you venture beyond image classification tasks? Let's imagine we want to do object detection instead. Meaning, instead of classifying only the whole image, we now want to detect and classify individual objects uh, on the image. With the current API, you're now stuck. The transforms do not support bounding boxes, and even if they did, they do not support a joint transformation of multiple inputs that we need for this. And this is where the work I'm presenting comes in. By importing the transforms from the prototype namespace, you can reuse the same pipeline without any additional modifications. Running the snippet yields the following result. The image you see looks exactly as the one as on the slide um, before, but in addition, the bounding boxes and their labels are handled as well. If you're a keen observer, maybe you caught another difference in the code snippet on the last slide that I didn't mention. Of course, we also need to pass the bounding boxes to transform for them to be handled. And then the question becomes, how do I do that? How do I pass my input to the transform? And the answer to this is, it doesn't matter. With our extension, you can use whatever input structure you prefer. On this slide, you see a few examples, but the comment on the last example is true. The input structure is actually arbitrary. Still, the type information of each input has to be communicated somehow. So how does it work? And the answer to that is already somewhat in the question. The type information is communicated through the actual type of the input. We introduce tensor subclasses that are thin wrappers around the plane tensors. They are zero copy abstraction and look and feel like the regular tensors that you are used to. In addition, they allow us to store metadata like the color space of an image or the format of a bounding box on the actual object rather than externally. The API currently supports images, videos, bounding boxes, masks, labels, and one-hot labels. Now that we have a 10,000 foot overview, Let's dive a little into the details. The API that we design comprises three levels ranging from high to low level functionality. The highest abstraction are the transform objects that we have already seen in the examples on the previous slides. As mentioned, they support arbitrary input structures. Each transform knows what kind of input it can handle and returns everything else unchanged. This means you can, for example, safely path to an image alongside the other inputs which can be very helpful if something goes wrong down the line. Plane tensors are treated as images or where applicable as videos to mimic the behavior of the old transforms. In addition, the transforms are now joined by design. Random parameters are sampled only once per call and applied to all inputs within the same. While the interface is fully backwards compatible, Torch script unfortunately does not allow arbitrary inputs or tensor subclassing, and thus the transforms are no longer JIT scriptable. The medium level of the API comprises the dispatches. In the current transforms, um, this is the functional API. They only support a single input, but it can be any of the previous mentioned tensor subclasses. Metadata like the color space of an image or the format of a bounding box is passed implicitly as attributes on the object. The dispatchers have the same fallback for plain tensors as the transforms have. For this use case, they remain fully JIT scriptable. The lowest level of the API are the kernels, which are also located inside the functional API. They were already present on the previous API, but were considered private. This extension promotes them to regular functionality. The kernels work with plain tensors and are thus decoupled from all the previously introduced abstractions. This means the metadata has to be passed explicitly, but they also that they are fully JIT scriptable. Although I haven't mentioned it on any level, Pillow images are still supported. The transforms and dispatchers handle them the same way they do with the tensor subclasses, and there are specific kernels just for them. Since we've already looked at some examples for the transforms, let's also have a look uh, at an example for the functional API. 
In the top half of the snippet, the kernel use case is shown. Apart from the values inside the tensor, you also have to pass the format as well as the spatial size of the image. By using the bounding box subclass, this metadata is stored on the tensor. Thus, you don't have to pass them explicitly to the dispatcher. Ultimately, of course, the resulting values are the same. With all of this extra functionality, there's still one a question looming in the background. Will the performance be worth? And I'm happy to report that the answer to this is no. In fact, we're actually a little bit faster than before. We made quite an effort to improve the performance of the API without compromising functionality. In most cases, I'm going to refrain to announce heavily aggregated numbers since there's too much nuance to fit into this talk. I'm going to focus on general trends instead. On the next slide, there's a link to a detailed report for you if you want to take a deep dive. Looking at the individual aspects of our, of our API, we see a marginal improvement for the pill backend. For the TIN tensor backend, there are a number of kernels we have improved significantly. The improvement is in double digit percentages. The remaining kernels are basically thin wrappers around single PyTorch operator, and thus we can't optimize them further from Torch Vision. Still, we're actively working uh, on them with the PyTorch core team to improve them as well. With this in mind, we can now also look at how this affects an actual training. We use the Torch Vision image classification recipe for benchmarking since it touches most parts of the API. As expected, the performance with the pill backend is basically the same. The same. For the Tensor backend, we made, measured an 80% improvement, which translates to a couple of hours on the hardware we used. Again, for the full benchmark in all of its glory, see the link on the next slide. And now the only thing that is left to say is we would love to hear your thoughts about this. You can reach us through the repository or more particular through the two issues displayed here. Thank you for listening, and we hope to hear from you soon.